Okay, a short announcement before our next international speaker. The last speaker has changed, so Eli is not coming today. And Otto, who was in the panel a couple of minutes ago, will have the last talk today with the topic called 10 things every developer should know about their database to run a very so there is going to be one change in the last week. But before this talk, we have Tom from the United States of America come to talk about I have to achieve what was the topic here. So your topic was personal, personalization at scale. So how to build dynamic and personalized content and segment in our audience. At least for me, this is kind of pretty interesting stuff of how you can actually set them, for example, different content you know, for different people or something like that. And so please welcome Doug in the front to speak in stuff. And after all, I don't blame you for being late right coming into my presentation. There's coffee, there's beer, it's a beautiful day, beautiful city. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here though, I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, one of the themes of this conference is about using WordPress to build sites, to build experiences. And that's what we want to do as we're, we're, um, as we're developing, as we're designing different kinds of things. It's not that we want to create something cool, which we do, it's that we want to create a great experience for our customers. We want to build something for them that helps them in some way. And then also drive some kind of business value for your clients and for yourselves. And so as we talked about before, about having goals, about achieving those goals, and, and driving it through experiences. So my background is, is um, a, a little bit of a mix. I, I wouldn't define myself as a developer, even though I've led development teams for, uh, we built, for example, uh, WordPress sites for a national uh, hotel chain. Uh, I've worked with some of the world's largest companies in terms of designing uh, marketing campaigns. I, I define myself more as a data kind of person. I'm very analytical. And so as we talk about these, um, you know, uh, I've noticed a lot of examples of code. I've noticed a lot of kind of focus on the development side. This is going to be a little bit more on the principles of design on what we try to achieve. And so I want to tell you, um, and I'll share a lot of examples about how we're doing this through uh, the, the company I'm currently at, which is Health Grades. And so HealthGrades doesn't provide any service in Finland, so I'm not selling anything. I'm just going to use it as an example. Um, and what it does, it, uh, and what we try to do is match uh, basically healthcare providers uh, to patients, to prospective patients. And so we all know that we can go in, we can go to the hospital, and we can see a doctor. But what we, we don't necessarily know up front is how, how does that doctor perform? How good are they at their job? And that's what HealthGrades tries to provide. So it provides a little bit more information about the, the physician's background, their experience, and then it combines a lot of uh, national data about um, how well they perform a certain surgery. So for example, you're getting a knee replacement surgery. Uh, I can go in, I can schedule that, whatever I have done, but how do I choose the right doctor? And that's what, that's what we're trying to do. Um, but talking about principles, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a, a completely different direction and tell you about another project that I work on, which is GOATS. I also, uh, in my free time, I have a, a goat farm, essentially. Uh, we have about 80 goats. And we also have um, one other thing. This is not a goat, this is a llama. Uh, and, and our llama protects the, goat, uh, protects the goats. Um, that's kind of their natural role, is that they, um, the llamas bond with the herd. And then we actually rent out the herd for weed control for invasive species management, land management. It's a fun hobby, it doesn't pay well. Uh, so I'll stick with my day job. But the, the neat thing in, in this is that as I talk about the different kinds of things that I do, um, most of it is very technically, technically driven, very technological. It has a lot of things that are, you know, kind of look like this. This is my space, right? Very, very innovative. But when I'm talking about things about using goats to manage land, using goats to eat weeds, um, and, hire, and using llamas to protect the goats, um, people are more likely to describe what I do here as innovative, as thinking outside the box, as something new. 
And it's funny to me because goats have been eating plants since millions of years. I don't know how long goats have been around, but much longer than anything else I do. And so um, the, the biggest principle out of all of this is that innovation and these kinds of things about being creative, about thinking outside the box, it's not really, we don't do that just for the sake of doing that. What we're really trying to do is just create an elegant solution, find a good way to do something. And that's what innovation for me is. It's not just like, let's make something new, let's make something the best code ever. It's let's create the best possible match between the, the problem we're trying to solve and our solution. And that doesn't always mean, you know, big and fantastic. It could be as simple as, let's get a go to keep them on. And that's what we're trying to do. So talking about personalization and scale, why do we want to personalize? What's, what's the benefit here? And it falls into three different categories. Uh, so category number one is conversion. We know that personalization increases conversion by, on average, 26%. So if you're building a website for your customers, uh, and they say, hey, we're really trying to drive business, uh, there's long-term value in looking at how you can, uh, or the short-term value in looking at how you can increase conversion through personalization. The next one is retention, meaning that people are more likely to come back to your site if you create a reason for them to come back to their site. Um, and then the last one is satisfaction. Not only do they convert more and stay around longer, but they like you better. They're more likely to refer you to their friends. They're more likely to, to share this uh, or follow you. Uh, they're more likely to promote this to their networks. And so as we talk about personalization, what personalization is, is two things. One, how can I help you now? Two, how can I help you next? That's personalization. How can I help you now? How can I help you next? And so when we look at it from a design standpoint, this is going to fall into three different buckets. Um, and this is what I would call kind of like our full stack marketing bucket, I guess. Um, and so it, it falls into three different things that we're going to need for this. Only how can I help you now? is the marketing aspects, the, the data aspects, and then the design and development aspects. And so let's talk about the, the, the marketing pieces first, because this is really the, the uh, one of the core pieces. And again, I know we're a lot of developers in here. I know we, we we're making a lot of these sites. Uh, but the, the first part about the marketing pillar in this is that it's kind of pointless if we don't really know who our customers are. And so I'm going to, in about two slides, tell you a little bit about the core elements of marketing. Uh, the first is, uh, the, uh, of these core elements, the, the first is target, right? It's just, who are, we, who are we talking to? Who visits our site? Who do we want to visit our site that's not visiting our site? Who are, we, who are we reaching out to? The next is the message. It's around what are we saying? Um, then the timing of when, when do we say those things? and then the channel. And so as we think about how we can personalize these, how we can make these unique, we have the option within each one of these different uh, uh, core elements to, to personalize that. We can adjust who we're talking to. Uh, we can adjust what we're saying to them. We can adjust when we say things or when we trigger things. And then lastly, we can, we can adjust the channel uh, of how we say things. So I know we're, again, we're talking about a website, but a website connects to a lot of different next to an account, an experience, a user, uh, an individual, and depending on the person, they may prefer different kinds of channels or different kinds of experiences. For me, reaching me through an app, I'm never going to download your app, I'm sorry, I'm just not. And so trying to reach me or engage me through an app isn't going to work, but there's definitely channels that would work very effectively. Um, same thing with timing and message and target. So I'll share some examples. Um, coming back to that, the healthcare model. Imagine that you're a patient, and you go in, and you have some joint pain. Maybe your, your knee hurts, or maybe your wrist hurts. Um, what do you do? What happens next? Do you just go to your doctor and, and hope it gets fixed? The, the, the reality is, in a customer journey like this, is that there's a lot of steps involved. This is actually one of, one of our, our models for, for uh, a specific patient, meaning that they go in, they identify some things, and they're going to talk to a lot of different people throughout their journey. They're going to go from uh, joint pain to talking to a physician, to talking to a specialist, to talking to a surgeon, to then uh, rehabilitation, recovery, pain management, and then um, you know caring for with a real normal lives. And so you imagine throughout that patient journey, um, what what kinds of how how that journey changes, what we say to them, how we talk what the message is, what the follow-up is, and when, when all of those things happen. 
thinking of something maybe a little bit simpler, like an e-commerce website. You know, it's what do you do when somebody's coming through the first time? How do you follow up when they've made a purchase? How do you follow up after the purchase? And so we can simplify that into a, a customer journey maybe that looks a little bit more like this, where it's some kind of uh, we require them or required information about them. We have a welcome. Uh, and the, the healthcare model is maybe a pre-appointment, mm -hmm. during the appointment, after the appointment, and then how do we retain that loyalty? The same kinds of things that apply here is that we'll be sending different messages at different times, and as a person moves through that entire life cycle, we'll treat them differently. We'll treat them as an individual at a certain, uh, because that's, that's what they are. And so as we talk about um, personalization, and it's not just one thing that's personal. Right? So we're going to talk about uh, the different models here with the different framework. And so I put these into three different categories. I'm going to list them as transactional, inferred, and predictive. And so transactional basically uh, is as simple as this. There's an action and a trigger, and an action and a response, action response. Inferred is looking at maybe a bunch of different actions and inferring a need. Uh, and then predictive is they haven't done anything yet, or they haven't all of the actions, how do you get to that? Uh, and so again, it's a phase approach. We're not necessarily jumping into straight into the predictive, but we're looking at how we can get there and what's relevant to, to get there. Um, again, building up, um, kind of building out our, our grid a little bit. Uh, starting simple is just a single action, single action and response. How can I get to what you need to what you need next? Uh, and then looking across, how can we do that throughout a, a single session? And then how can we do that across a segment uh, for more people? And then lastly, as we're working a little bit more advanced, what we want to build up is, into is, how can I do this within just a single channel? How can I do this on my website? And then moving forward, we'll look at multi-channel. How can I do that same response? Now I'm following up in an email. What do you need next based on what they did on the site? Or I'm following up within the app or an account or within mail or other channels. How do we connect these things together? Uh, and then the last thing that we'll get to, which is kind of the, the premier, especially if you do anything in, in a business to business kind of world, uh, or even for us, is what we call householding, is how do you predict across a company, a company's behavior? What's a propensity to buy for a company? And how do you predict that and adapt towards that? So, again, where we want to start is very much in this simple simple side. Let's start simple um, because we don't need to reinvent everything and we don't work. And maybe that's good enough. And so um, where we'll go from here is let's look at transactional. So transactional personalization is, is the good thing here is you're probably already doing this. We're just not calling it personalization per se. Um, and so using the definition of what you need and what you need next, uh, transactional things could be like you made a purchase, right? For transaction, that's obvious. You've logged in. You've added something to your cart. You've uh, maybe added something to your wish list. You've opted in for tracking. Um, you've selected a language, basic sign up. These kinds of things are very, very transactional kinds of things. And now we can start saying, hey, I know a little bit where you are, and I know where a little bit about what you need next. The neat thing about this is, is we're thinking, like, hey, that's hard. How do I know that? How do I know what they need? And, and we can kind of put it in the inverse, and we can say, I know what I don't know yet. I know that you haven't done these things. I know you haven't made a purchase yet in this session. I know you haven't logged in, or maybe you don't have an account. I know that you haven't, or you're using the default language setting. I know you haven't signed up. I know you haven't done any of these things. So how do I help you? How do I make that you know, an offer? And then stop offering it once you have done those things. And so this, these, again, are very simple kinds of things that you're probably already doing, uh, and just, we just don't call them personalization, right? You're, uh, and so I want to share one example of, of, of how we've done this. Um, and so I think a lot of sites have something like this, which is a newsletter sign-up, right? This is our default newsletter sign-up, um, and it goes on a lot of our pages. And so, you know, uh, who has something like this? A lot of a lot of sites do, you, and you've all seen something like this. And so one of the things we wanted to say is, hey, I don't know anything really about the customer yet. How can I help them a little bit better? How can I be a little bit more responsive? And so what we did is we created a lot of versions of this, and that, um, and, and then we put them in contextually relevant places, meaning that if you're in a general place, maybe you see this, but if you're looking for an optometrist, or maybe you see something that's a little bit more contextually relevant. And this is 
not just like hard coded in, it's, it's a little bit of programmatic based off the metadata of the page content groups. Um, and so we can say, hey, you're on something that's related to optometry, now you did this. And we have a bunch of them. Um, I think there's like 39 of them, I didn't put them all in here. But now, now it's a little bit more contextually relevant. Um, for the customer, it's, hey, what do you need? What do you need next? Let's, let's help you. Let's say that we're, or show a little bit that we're responsive. And even doing that amount has been phenomenally effective for us um, because it's a lot more personalized to the customer and customer needs. And not only has it been more effective for us immediately in the signups, but it's been more effective up for us downstream, meaning that when people sign up, they're more likely to open that email. They're more likely to read that email. They're more likely to click through that email. We see a lot more traffic coming through that. And so even that simple step of just providing a little bit more contextually relevant content up front has seen phenomenal uh, conversions for us downstream. And so again, as we look at who are we targeting, in this case, it's the general audience versus maybe somebody who's looking at a, a, a optometrist. But then also, what's the message? How do we segment them? And how do we do uh, control that timing? In this case, it was as simple as, we know you haven't opted in yet. So let's give you that offer after you view three or four pages. I don't remember exactly what it is. But it, it, it's a very kind of simple action and trigger. One way we kind of fool ourselves into doing this is what I'm going to boldly say is A-B testing is bad. Sort of. Okay, don't freak out. Just sort of bad. So, so one of the, the examples I want to share with in this is what if we had done this? What if we had said, hey, I have an offer, and I'm going to show this offer to everybody, and we're going to A-B test this. I mean, we're going to show some to some people, some to some other people, and we're going to pick the best one. And let's say I had nominal click-through rate. Meaning 10% of people fill out this one, 12% of people fill out that one. In a normal A-B test, I'd pick, which one would I pick? B, right? It, it performs better. <coughs> the thing that we're fooling ourselves around a little bit is that we don't know what that data actually looks like. We don't know if there's something like 8% of the people who would have um, clicked through on either. We don't know if it looks like this, meaning that there's two completely different audiences. And so the thing that we're not asking within AP testing necessarily is why. Why would some people click this one over here or that one, and why wouldn't they click the other one? Is there any commonalities? Is there anything I'm saying that maybe better resonates with a certain, uh, maybe a certain group of people, maybe by demographics, maybe by age, maybe by interest, maybe by device? Um, and more importantly, it doesn't address what this is. Why, did, why are these people, how, why am I not able to help them or identify them? And so, um, really A-B testing is fine, but what we want to look at is, is in segmentation uh, combined with A-B testing so that we're able to be a little bit more relevant um, and, and do things a little bit better. Um, again, we also want to make sure that we're not aiming at that we're really focused on, on that, how can I help you um, as an aside, I was working as, uh, on a small project and I noticed something about uh, all of these GDPR disclaimers. Do you see these? Do you see how terrifying they look? It's just like, like you know, it's like something's wrong, like we're being completely, you know, shut down and censored. So as you guys are developing these, can you please not put them in big black and red buttons and like alert, alarm, things are going wrong. Like maybe we can be a little bit friendlier. Uh, with them, or maybe that's worth, worth a little bit of testing as well. So let's talk about this next, this next group, where we, where we want to get to. Again, I, I feel like probably most people are, are doing some part of this transactional uh, element, so let's talk a little bit about this inferred element and how we get there. Um, and this is where containers come in. This is how we, we deploy this in a scalable way and do it without going crazy and trying to create a unique site for, for every individual user. So as we talk about containers, I'm going to talk about containers. Does anybody know when, when the containers were invented? I'll tell you. It was in 1958, and it revolutionized shipping. Before that, everything was shipped in boxes, crates, barrels, and more importantly, they had to be unpacked and repacked every time you unloaded something from a ship, from a, from a truck. Um, and so it just was really, really time-consuming to create all of these things. 
logistics of what a container did in shipping. Uh, and logistics is it made it very easy to take this box, fill it with whatever good, goods you want, put it onto a ship, take that same box, put it onto a train, then onto a truck, and get it to its final destination. And so it has a lot of benefits in that we, it really standardizes the delivery aspect for us. It makes it, uh, I mean, these are empty by default, meaning you have to put something in them, uh, but it's the same container regardless. It's easier to manage performance, it's easier to put where you want, and you can fill them with anything. You can put anything you want into the container. In the real world, people have also been extremely creative with these containers. They've done crazy things like building houses out of them, or restaurants, or um, a wide variety of other things. And so as we look at containers and deploying a personalized uh, aspect, when, um, when I'm working with clients, one of the things that I think about that I'm going to be asking them to do is create a unique site for every person. Um, for health grades, for example, we have 20 million monthly viewers. I'm not creating 20 million sites a month. What I want to do is create a container that I can put in that has a contextually relevant or personalized offer for that person. And the neat thing is the data behind that, once I've figured out the data element of it, I can populate my container in any different medium that I want. I can send that out in an email. I can send that out in a printed format, I can send that out in an app, uh, or definitely on the website. And so again, the same principles uh, apply here. It's empty by default, uh, meaning that if I don't know anything about that person, it just collapses flat. Um, but it's also very rich, it's very timely. It allows me to personalize that, that message, that offer, that what you need next um, element in a very uh, effective way. And so, uh, as we work through it, um, let me share an example. And again, the, 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 the execution of this does require a little bit of this marketing. Uh, it does require a little bit of integration with data. And it does require some design. Um, and so one of the, the pieces about data is how do I know what a person needs next? And the best way that I've found um, is pulling an example from Harry Potter. Uh, and so everybody knows, do you know what this is? This is the sorting hat, right? How does the sorting hat work? Really? Sorting hat works, basically what the sorting hat does in, in the movie Harry Potter is that it, it puts you into different houses, right? So from a marketing perspective, we'll say it puts you in different segments. It puts you into different groups. Um, and it doesn't just do that by who you are, but also by what you want, uh, just like in Harry Potter. It's not who you are, but what you want that matters. And so within this, what, what um, what I've done and deployed in a lot of different cases is providing the ability for people to uh, self-identify without necessarily understanding that they're, uh, without like explicitly asking them, right? This isn't the Seinfeld movie phone of tell me what you want. It's let's click on, let's um, uh, present a few offers and see what people do. And so specifically in this case, what we'll do is we'll put together a piece of content or a web page or a landing page, and it has a main offer, just like a good page should have, and then maybe it says, hey, would you be interested in these things? And these things um, could be our containers, where they're dynamically populated, or they could be hard-coded in and pre-written. And basically what I'm looking at is, do they still have any one of these offers? Are they more interested in this than something else? And when they do, I start to understand what they're interested in, what aspect of a, a, a product or something that they're interested in, um, so that I can understand how to act, how to work with them better. From a data back end, this can get very complicated, and then I kind of keep asking, keep asking, and really refine it down. Um, to show one story of this, I'm going to go back here really quick. Um, so I, I used to work for the um, world's largest uh, medical device company, uh, Medtronic. And a lot of their devices are in hospital capital equipment kinds of things. Uh, things you would spend like $100,000 to a $1 million to, to purchase. And they're, they're very complex kinds of systems. And so one of the things that we wanted to understand is, as we're talking to, to hospitals and, and physicians, is what aspect of this are they interested in? And so we deployed the same kind of model where they would go through and we would present an offer and say, hey, here's some things you can learn about. And we would look at where they went and then kind of start personalizing uh, and, and messaging towards that. And what we did is, is using the same kind of container method, 
we personalize aspects of the site where we have just those little little boxes. We integrated that into email, we integrated that into print materials, we integrated that into a lot of different things. And what we saw is that from people coming through, we had a 90% conversion, 89% I exaggerated, 89% conversion. When do you ever have an 89% conversion rate on anything? Uh, and so by, by going through and um, looking at what a person needs and what they need next can be incredibly powerful. Uh, so overall, within this kind of project, within this campaign, we saw phenomenal um, results throughout the, the entire funnel across all of our channels. Again, we're looking at a multi-channel kind of experience. And then our emails had uh, upwards of 40% open rate or 45% open open rate. Uh, if you're not familiar with email marketing, typically that's like 10 to 15%. Um, and so we're, we're well above baseline and uh, what we want to be there. We saw people engaging with our content, viewing more content, working through um, different kinds of things. And most importantly, we hit a revenue goal. Again, this is a, a million dollar, multi million dollar business unit. We hit our, our, our business goal in six months for sales. Uh, and so to, to be able to kind of design these things has incredible value for your customers and for uh, for the business. The other neat thing that we learned through this is if we took a standard segmentation model and just said, hey, you're a you're a uh, respiratory therapist or some kind of therapist, we think you're going to be interested in this and you're a nurse so you'll be interested in that. When we let people choose, we found out that we would have been wrong about 48% of the time. Uh, meaning that if we had gone back through an A-B tested, we would have picked the, the right one technically because it would have been right 52% of the time. But for almost half the people, we would have been presenting the wrong message, wrong track. And so by tying that in, we're able to do um, some, some really neat things. Uh, and again, it's, it's around this more for looking at behaviors and continued behaviors uh, over time. This next one is, is predictive. And predictive, I don't think, is, is it, it's marketed a lot. I don't think it's realized very, very often. I don't think we have the technology yet to do this very effectively. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we can do to start getting there. Because the, the principle here is um, basically inferring things off things you haven't done yet, right? It's easy to infer uh, what your need is based off things you have done. But pulling in um, what we would need to know uh, or what we don't know to make that, that guess off what you have done, that's hard. And it's also a little bit Personally, as a marketer, I'm going to say it's a little creepy because it means I have to get that data from somewhere else, meaning that you haven't necessarily given me permission for that. Uh, and so I'm taking things that, that maybe I don't have a, a right to take uh, as well. Um, but let's, let's talk about what, what this might look like. The first one is a, is a testing one, is how do we go about testing whether or not we really want to get into uh, some kind of predictive kind of thing instead of just looking at this uh, Inferred. Uh, and so our testing model looks something like this: is that basically how do I how do I start? So I'm going to have to communicate to you in some way. What does that engagement look like? And then I'll have an evaluation step and an investment step. So meaning that I'm going to deploy something. We're going to measure how it does, and then we're going to figure out on a user by user or company by company basis whether or not it's worth investing further. And then we can kind of start working. Um, but the biggest point with, with this is, how does it really help our customers drive the journey? Does, do I really need a, a predictive capability, or can I really infer on a user by user basis uh, on what they need? And so, as we're looking on applying this model, it looks at how do I help them discover something? How do I help them learn more about it? How do I help them investigate the need for it? Uh, engage with or, or kind of complete that step and then ultimately decide whether or not they're going to do it. Uh, and so that's where a lot of these different things as we talk about timing isn't necessarily timing, you know, today versus tomorrow, but it's timing along our different path. Uh, and so we can, we can start looking at those, um, uh, <coughs> looking at our message uh, and how we can adapt it over, over those times. And then the last one, as we look at the different aspects of both predictive and inferred, is really how we're working through the different elements
events and, and what our triggers are. So these can be things like what have you done, uh, but also whether or not um, we're really making these the right messages, whether or not they're actionable messages, whether or not we're integrating across channels, and, and um, whether or not we're, we're really getting the personalization we want or whether we're really just creating one of those for our customers. Um, again, basically the, the last thing is that every campaign that we do, every every website that we create, every page that we put up, ultimately is, is people-based. And so what we're really trying to do is make a better experience for that user by understanding what, what they need and then what they need next. Um, again, our model here is, is gives us something to work for us. Um, it gives us something to, to try to achieve, but it definitely doesn't require that we immediately go all the way to the top right and, and do everything. But it's really looking at how can we implement little steps that make that person's journey for themselves a little bit better. And that's what, what I really want to leave with you. And so with that, I'll close. And thank you very much.
like the way the materials that Design CX has, they're all free. I'm not selling you anything. You can go on and download them and, and work through them yourselves. Um, but ultimately, that's that's the biggest piece, and that's where again, from a data side, I'm a data geek. I love looking through what those alternate paths are. What does the multi-touch journey look like, uh, and what what else do people do, and how can I help that part better rather than just the end game? Really good question. And thank you for being a moderator.